they have both gotten reps with runs. All right, so the, the first comment is going to be very short, and we're going to play it right now. James, are you ready to name a starting kicker, punter, or quarterback? No. I love how you referenced it, but no, we have not even done it as a staff yet. So I'm not saying that he's not telling the truth. What I'm saying is fans have a hard time believing that. I think a lot of us have a hard time with that logical leap of what we've seen and James Franklin saying we have not decided on a starting quarterback. So how do you take this information, Fitz? How, how do you just wrap all of this into, like, okay, we, this is what's going on? I smile and nod. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> because all emphasis uh, from the program, I mean, all, you know, just all the information, you know, Drew has been the guy throughout camp. I mean, they, they haven't really tried to hide it. But also at the same time, Neil Brown hasn't named a starter for West Virginia. So maybe there's some gamesmanship here. Uh, maybe it's it, it's something else. But, you know, until he I don't think until he has to name a starter, he's he's in the camp of why why give any information whatsoever, even though everybody thinks it's going to be all or everybody, you know, everybody's coming in to interview Drew and they're not turning them down. You know, th this is a situation where uh, a couple of years ago, if there's a there's a battle and you asked to talk to one guy, they would not do that because they wouldn't make the other guy available. You know, it's just the whole thing. So, but everything has been pointing to drew. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I, I know they, they named Tyler Duzanski the starter at long snapper. So, I mean, they did. They did we'll be getting the special away. team stuff in just a second, but you're right. Nate, do you have anything else to add to this? And, and this is, this is what I was saying to begin the show. Like this is kind of a hammer from me of like, th there's no nuance to what he said. It was blunt. It was no, yeah, and it was very short, so there's not a lot of reading between. No, we haven't talked about it, and maybe they haven't intentionally talked about it as a staff so that he can say that. Like they haven't, they haven't officially made this decision because they they don't want to talk about it uh, publicly. Yeah, no, there's there is a process, and I, I will say that I I look a couple of things. One, when does James Franklin get backed into a corner? Never. He does things on his own <laughs> timeline. He does what he wants. And there is a process. He's so process oriented. And one of the processes, processes that he goes through every preseason is okay. The, the D squad, right. He talked about it last night. The D squad finds out on Monday from him that they're going to be D squad Tuesday. They hear it from their position coaches. They have those conversations Wednesday. You see that at practice. They have not, I, I truly, I, I know nobody wants to hear this. They truly have not made decisions, like actual rubber stamped decisions on starters at multiple decisions or at multiple positions. I, I truly, between one and two, that, that, is, yeah. that is absolutely true. Now, does it mean that they don't know exactly what they're going to do at quarterback? Of course not. They know exactly what they're going to do, but they have not been through that process. Like that, that is true. They have not been through that process. They, and when he says this about, we haven't even decided it between the, the coaching staff. It means the coaching staff talks about it. The coaching staff decides it. The coaching staff brings in those players individually and as a group and makes that call. They, they tell them personally, it's a conversation. That conversation as of Wednesday night at whatever time that was, 630 that had not happened now could it have happened at 7 30 p.m last night absolutely <laughs> i don't think there's any question yep. that 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 is where we're at and so the timing of the press conference very much in my opinion probably had something to do with with where they're at because i i don't believe by this time tomorrow that that conversation will have not have already taken place like it yeah but, and but I, I would Go ahead. They've Vince. only got eight, they've only got eight eight days to get NBC in here to rework the promo if they're going to go with Bo because <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty well front and center and has been since the spring. So, but they're gonna they're gonna tell yeah. the team too, right? Like they're gonna have a, they're gonna have an announcement to the team. It's gonna it's gonna be a thing, and that thing has not happened yet. So, just you, let you it know, happen. Yeah, you gotta you gotta take him at his word there. Yep, and uh, that's always I think that that's always a fair thing to say too about James Franklin. Is he he doesn't lie. Like there's no there's no lie there. It is. But again, like you said, structured so that he doesn't have to lie. It, it, um, it's remarkable that you make that point because he's actually pretty upfront with a lot of things. If you if you know what you're listening for and you know how to take it, like you know how to interpret it, like he's actually he's a lot better than Joe was. A lot better than Bill was. Like well, Bill, depending on where you got Bill. 
Um, but uh, it, it, it's a situation where I think people are so um, predisposed to the coach lying to them that, or, or trying to do, trying to be smarter than everybody in the room, et cetera. Um, and I think that that's kind of where we're at with, we don't believe, believe it on the face. So I think he's pretty upfront about some of this stuff. Sometimes some of the stuff he protects, I think more so than lies, you know, and, yeah. and I think you find that with a lot of college coaches is it will be pretty upfront with you if you ask the right questions. And uh, you know, that's sometimes when you get closer, these guys are so paranoid, man, these guys, these college coaches are, they're a different breed. Like that's, that's kind of the, the, the genes that they've, that they're coming from here is that they, they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to answer a question if it's not asked. Like Smith Vilbert has been injured since the spring. Nobody asked about Smith Vilbert. And yep. so we didn't talk about him until August. Like that's kind of like that, that is the whole mentality of a college coach is like control everything that you can control. And then eventually when it does have to get out there, you know, know the way that you're going to approach it. So speaking of, let's talk about the one of the biggest storylines going all the way back to February, which is Dante Cephas and the multiple views of what he's doing at Penn State camp and what he's going to be for Penn State. Uh, this is James Franklin updating us on where he is right now through camp. Yeah, he's in that group that's battling. We got a competitive group of four to five guys that, that are battling. Uh, he's part of that conversation. Um, we've had some really good conversations. You know, I think he realizes that this has been different, the adjustment, especially with the DBs and the man-to-man -man coverage that we play. Um, it's just different. It's not saying that, that he's not a big-time, big-time player, but there's a difference between getting up one or two days uh, a week or one or two times a year in a season, coming out here every single day with that type of competitiveness uh, uh, that you need to be successful. So it's been a, a really good adjustment for him. He's handled it really well, and he's part of that group um, you know, that's competing for those spots. So when it comes to translating, because again, very upfront about where how he's doing, not necessarily what we've observed of where he is on the depth chart and the pecking order when we go to practice, uh, but more of where he is on that, that process of being towards the top of the depth chart. Nate, how do you ride those two lines of, of what to expect yep. from Dante Cephas and what James Franklin is saying there about his progress so far? I, okay, so a couple of things. The the first is when James says that he's handled it well, to me, that means he's receiving the feedback. He's receiving the criticism and saying, yeah, I, I do have to do that, right? Like Because there there is a world where you can hear that as one of the top receivers in the transfer portal last offseason and say, come on. Like, uh, no, you could be resistant to it. I don't think he's doing that. I think Dante Cephas is doing all of the things that, he is in he's being intentional about trying to fix those things but also there's an acknowledgement there from James Franklin like yeah this is a different level this is this is a different level of football these are different opponents that he's facing within his own defense which is a common refrain this preseason is mm -hmm. that this is one of the better defenses that they're going to face all year right so Penn State's offense won't see an opponent with a defense much better than Penn State's, if at all. So that that has to go into this too, right? Is how do these guys fare against competition that is not of Penn State's quality? That will help, I think, sort out some of that receiver room. But for Dante Cephas specifically, when when the entire storyline, and, and look, we're, we're as guilty of it as anybody in terms of on three having Dante Cephas ranked as high as he was in the transfer portal, like that – yeah, there there is the possibility of him being that type of guy, but being that guy at uh, Kent State and being that guy at Penn State are, are very much two different things. And so you you are now going through that process with an abbreviated run up because yep. he wasn't able to get in in January. So yep. now you're doing it on a truncated timeline. That means that's that's harder. It's harder to do. He's going through it. And the, the positive news, if you're a Penn State fan for Dante Cephas and have high hopes for Dante Cephas, is that he is trying. <laughs> he's, he's, he's coming at it with an honest effort, which it doesn't the always right happen. Way. Correct. He's approaching it the right way instead of being frustrated or being uh, uh, defensive that he is not the top receiver on the team. He's working through what they're asking him to work through. Is that a fair way to say that? Absolutely. Fitz, any thoughts? Yes. Nate, can I pull off the short sleeve hoodie? 
Wow. Wasn't that a great look? I love that love fit. It. Like that's like combining my two favorite things there. So yeah, look no, at that's that. not that's not you, buddy. Not I like the dark. They were wearing these the 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 black hats and the black uh, shirts yesterday. I love that look. I think it looks sharp. Okay, I'm gonna have to deal <laughs> with that anyway. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I thought Dante Cephas would come in and be a starter right away. That didn't happen. And now it's not about declaring him a bust, declaring him a potentially great player. It's about pivoting and figuring out how he can contribute to the team, how he can be that be that guy eventually. Because I think he has the talent, and they think he has the talent. Like he, it's there. The quick turnaround does not help. He, if you recall, he was on his own this spring, so working out on his own, no football activity in the spring, uh, like team activity or anything like that. Got here in the summer, had to turn it around pretty quick. That's tough to do. Taking a giant leap up from Kent State, where you can get by week to week. Like the MAC is very good football. Like don't don't get me wrong, it's not Power Five football, it's not Big Ten football. You can get by week to week by being better than that guy, and you don't always have to be, quote unquote, on your game. He played, you know, fairly well against some some bigger schools and things like that. But from week to week, he was just better than that Mac competition. That's not going to happen. And the guys that you're going up against, uh, you know, and, and by by going up against, I mean that group of four or five receivers. There's some talent in there. Like the look, these these guys are not bums. They're not uh, they're not guys that uh, you know are just like if they go somewhere, they they can be productive players. Um, this is a group that is going to I see, I would say. Um, uh, extend itself in the sense that you can potentially find some big 10 level starters out of this group. It's not a situation where they all suck and you're just got, you have to pick the, the best one is, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah. I think Cephas can find his way into that. He's got, he has to be more consistent. Somebody asked in the chat, if he has a, a second year, he does. And I think he would be wise to use it just based on the, the feedback that we've gotten so far. But I, I, again, I go back to it, it, it. If you're struggling to want to call him a bust, don't do that yet. If you're struggling to want to call him one of the top five receivers in the conference, like Dave Wan said, don't do that either. Just kind of let him go. Cause this is a guy that if he's going to do it is probably going to not going to do it game one, but might be one of those guys that does it by game five. So I think that's, that's what you look at with Cephas. There's got to be some perspective here, man. It's not all black and white. So that's where I'm coming uh, from, from Cephas. He's a very talented kid. He's just got to be more consistent week to week and practice to practice because you're going against Johnny Dixon and Kalen King and that group of corners is going to make you better. The uh, coach speak answer is that you better be better at the end of the season than you are at the start of the season. And Dante Cephas using the next four weeks and then the next four weeks after that to get better and to understand everything he needs to do from the Penn State perspective is a part of this conversation as well. I think you make a great point of like, don't look at it as uh, the starting line of the season is the end point of his development and the end point of his time at Penn State. You need to look at it as the growth and development throughout the season, just like, you know, Abdul Carter last year as a true freshman was better in the middle of the season and so therefore became a starter. So I think that's a very fair point to make.